Today we are starting a new series of readings and sermons. It's an eight-week series on the fourth gospel, the Gospel of John. Unlike the Moses series where we more or less followed the storyline, this is a bit like going to, for example, an art gallery, say the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square, and signing up for highlights of the National Gallery in eight paintings, something like that. We're not going to visit everything, far from it, but we'll visit certain parts and we'll get a flavour of John's Gospel and of the distinctive nature of it, which makes it very different from the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. And today we're reading a very well-known passage from the 14th chapter of John, reading from verses 1 through to 21. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Amen. May God bless to us this reading from his word. During the campaigning for a general election a few years back, I read an interesting article by a journalist who had followed one of the party leaders around the country. They had gone to a school in the south of England for a short 10 minute visit and photo opportunity, then into the campaign bus to get a plane to the Midlands to visit an old folks home for another photo shop. Then they flew up to Scotland for another visit somewhere. 
The amount of time that was spent travelling was far greater than the amount of time actually meeting the public. But the purpose of all this was to present the leader in a school, saying that education was very important to his party. And a school was the best setting to make a statement about education. And they wanted to have television pictures that either showed the leader beside the children at the tables, or listening to the teachers in the staff room, or out in the playground. This was to show that their candidate, their man, their leader, really cared about education. They also wanted to present their leader in an old folks home, saying that social services were important to them. So a residential home was the best place to make this statement and to see the leader asking the residents about the old days, drinking tea with them and even passing the biscuits. This was to show that their man and their party were concerned about social services and would look after them if elected. And to present their leader as being concerned not just with the south of England but with the country at large. It was important to show him somewhere well away from London, somewhere like Scotland. Presentation, news management, that was very much the point of the exercise. Now John's Gospel is not about news management, about photo opportunities and political campaigning. But it is about presenting Jesus to us, about giving us insights and pictures about who and what he was and is. It's about giving us what John will call signs. John is thoughtful about the scenes and stories that he chooses from all the material that is available to him. When John takes a story about Jesus, say the wedding at Cana and turning the water into wine, John is telling us about something that Jesus once did. And also about something that John wants us to know he is still doing today. We'll come back to that in a few moments and indeed we'll devote one of the sermons to that very story. But for the moment, let's set John's Gospel in context. As we know, there are four Gospels, which are each collections of stories of the life of Jesus. As we've said before, Mark's Gospel was written first. The mid to late 60s or even into the 70s. Luke was written in the late 60s or probably into the 70s. Matthew was written somewhere between 75 to 85 AD. Matthew, Mark and Luke are known as the Synoptic Gospels and they have a lot in common. Many stories appear in all three Gospels and there's a lot of overlap. John's Gospel is different. Jesus speaks in John's Gospel for much longer than he does in the others. John's Gospel was written in the 90s AD or possibly even later. So John's Gospel was written some time after the life, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Maybe 60 plus years since his death. That's a long time. And in John's day there would be very few people with any kind of direct memory of Jesus. So the question would be very relevant. It's quite a long time now since Jesus was with us on earth. In what way is Jesus still present and active amongst his followers? That would be a question, a relevant question, a big issue for the community to whom John, the Christian community to whom John was writing. It's one of the main themes of John. In this gospel, Jesus talks about sending the Holy Spirit who is one with Jesus and with God. And this is presenting us with the idea that by the Spirit of Jesus, the Jesus who did these things that are described in the Gospels is with us today and still doing these things. And miracles in John's Gospel are called signs. That is, they point to something. They point to the power of God acted in Jesus then and now. William Barclay, the late Professor William Barclay, who many of us will still remember his television shows a long time ago. Willie Barclay in his commentary says, Now we can see what John is teaching us. Every story tells us not something which Jesus did once, 
and never again, but rather of something which he is forever doing. Let's look at some of the stories and see if we can make sense of that. Back then, Jesus turned water into wine. Wine conveys ideas of joy and celebration, mealtimes, happiness, richness and fullness. Now, Jesus turns the drabness of life into life in all its fullness. Jesus brings richness, vibrancy, joy to our lives as we allow him to do it. Back then, Jesus fed 5,000 people. Jesus took the wee boys packed lunch and used it. Jesus still takes the little that we can offer and does a great deal with it. Back then, Jesus came walking on the water to his disciples. Now, Jesus, through the Spirit, still comes to us when we are afraid. Back then, Jesus healed a man who had been born blind, while others refused to accept what Jesus was saying. Now, Jesus opens us all to spiritual truth and insight if we are willing to have our inner eyes opened. Perhaps one of the challenging yet also very enriching things for us to do is to equate the Jesus who did things then with a sense of God's Spirit in our hearts and lives today. Our own experience of discovering fresh joy can be mirrored in the story back then of water into wine. Our own experience of what little we have being used greatly to help others can be mirrored in the story of the wee boy's food feeding 5,000. Our experience of what a friend we have in Jesus, our experience of a calm presence and a strength coming to us in scary times, perhaps in answer to prayer, can be mirrored in the walking on water. Our experience of new insights and understanding can be mirrored in the healing of the blind man. To read and engage with John's Gospel is also to be invited to reflect upon our own lives and to be alert to what is happening in them and to see the stories from the Gospel as signs of what God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit are still doing in our life and in the world today. And over the coming weeks, we're going to take some of the stories from the Gospel and we're going to try to do just that.